So my question to you is how can we improve lay perceptions of energy consumption to facilitate energy conservation? So one idea that I sort of heard yesterday was you know, using real-time feedback via smart meters coupled with behavioral interventions to try to really push individuals to conserve energy. And we can talk a little, little more about that today. So now let me switch to the next part of the, uh, part of the talk. But any questions about the previous one? Yep. Did you control for uh, socioeconomic status, uh, income levels of the participants? Yes, we did. We actually looked at income, education, uh, whether you were Republican, Democrat, none of those were statistically significant, which was, a, which, was, which was really interesting because most people would think, oh, the more educated you are, the more information you have in your brain, you might have more accurate perceptions. But what we find is that not, that is not the case. And the thing is, numeracy is independent of education. So you can be numerate, but not, do not, not have a very high degree. And you can be innumerate and have a pretty high degree. So that was an interesting finding. <laughs> so that's not, so as you saw, we try to go after a lot of different participants in the United States. We did not ask them how much they pay for electricity, but hopefully that's something that we are, we are trying to get at in, our, in one of the studies that I'm planning currently, and I'll be walking you through a few of them. All right, so let me move on. People's perceptions, sorry, people's preferences for change. Do individuals prefer voluntary actions, soft regulations, or hard regulations to change their behavior? So the government has been regulating risks for quite some time now. We have seatbelt laws in New York City. We have a ban on trans fat, a ban on smoking in public places. We have a whole variety of regulations. However, the government is still to regulate um, behaviors in the realm of climate change or energy consumption. And so that leads us to a social dilemma of conservation. Now, what is a social dilemma? A social dilemma is where private interests are at odds with collective interests. So for example, um, if energy is relatively cheap, I don't really have an incentive to conserve energy. I can use as much energy as I want as an individual, but that really puts the collective at harm. So that sort of leads to the tragedy of the commons is what Garrett Harding coined. So let me just walk you through this uh, matrix. So if I conserve energy, and if you all conserve energy, the environment wins. We sort of mitigate climate change, we don't have to worry about it. If I do not conserve energy, and if everyone else does not conserve energy, the environment loses, and that leads to the tragedy of the commons. Now as an individual, I face these different, these different problems where I conserve energy and nobody else conserves energy, so I feel like I'm a drop in the bucket. That my effort does not actually matter, so I sort of feel, you know, nobody else is doing it, why should I do it? So I'm just not gonna do it. So that actually pushes me to this last quadrant. Alternatively, if all of you conserve energy, I'm like, all right, you know, everyone else is doing it, I don't need to do it, I can drive my Hummer if I want. So that is what, what John last night called free loading, but it's, it's also referred to as free riding. So I'm free riding on your sacrifice. So what I wanted to look at is how, you know, what do people prefer in terms of how to change their behavior? If it's voluntary, it's really easy to sort of push people into this last quadrant. If it's a hard regulation, so if the government comes in and says you can or cannot do something, it's really easy to sort of be in this quadrant. But people's preferences for change are totally different. Um, so how do we solve this tragedy of the commons? So what Garrett Harding said in his uh, seminal paper in Science was that the tragedy of the commons as a cesspool can only pre be prevented by coercive laws or taxing devices that make it cheaper for the polluter to treat the pollutants rather than to discharge them into the environment. So coercive laws or taxing devices, those both sound really scary to me, right? So what do regulations rest on? Regula regulations rest on political will or public support. So in this particular study, I wanted to for, sort of figure out what is the public support for these different types of change. So you can think of these three different ways of changing um, public behavior as points along a continuum, with the least amount of governmental interference to the most amount of, uh, amount of governmental interference. So voluntary action is basically the lack of regulations. You can choose to recycle or choose not to recycle. Soft regulations, incentives, taxes, subsidies, changes in default. So those involve a little bit of government regulation, but it, but it does not necessarily curb your choice set. You can still choose to drive an inefficient vehicle, but you'd probably have to pay for it. And finally, hard regulations. These are enforced rules, bans, like the seatbelt law, ban in smoking, ban in trans fats. So the government really comes down and says, all right, this is what you can or cannot do. It curbs your choice set. So which one of these would people prefer? 
So one hypothesis is that hard regulations will be preferred because you know we all in this together, we're all suffering through this together, we're all trying to do the right thing. We're all working towards an end goal together. Um, and this is an idea that has been debated um, with actually George Lowenstein um, in behavioral economics. Another alternative is psychological reactants. So I really don't like it when people, when the government comes in to curb my choice set. So psychological reactance is actually with, where people respond really negatively to any force that curbs their choice set. So let me illustrate psychological reactance with, by an example. So in the 1960s, the EPA banned phosphates and detergents. Now in Florida, Brem and Mazes actually did the study where they asked women in, in, in the county, would you be in favor of this ban? Most of those women said, yeah, that sounds great. I'm pro-environmental. I want to ban phosphates and detergents. Do the right thing by, by the water, right? But women that were forced to change their laundry um, detergent after the ban reacted so negatively that some even smuggled phosphate detergents from neighboring counties. So what that means is that psychological reactance is a very strong phenomenon. Yep. What'd you say? Were their clothes cleaner with the phosphate detergent? No, it's, it's, it's psychological, right? Yeah, that's why it's called psychological reactance. So the clothes are not necessarily cleaner one way or another, but they convince themselves that, you know, the brights are getting brighter with phosphates and detergents. So, so my, my question was, which one is stronger? Is it psychological reactance or that people are just willing to do the right thing and we're all in this together so they don't necessarily feel like they're, they're able to free ride or feel like a drop in the bucket? So where, where does our CO2 come from in the United States? It comes from five major sectors, commercial, residential, industrial, transportation, and electricity generation. So for this reason, I sort of wanted to focus on transportation and electricity generation just to sort of take a chip off the big iceberg. And it's for that reason that I focused on trying to limit SUVs and trucks and trying to encourage green energy consumption in the, ho in the home. So that led me to sort of uh, th uh, this particular matrix. So for the voluntary action for SUVs and trucks, it says, would you pledge not to buy a low mileage or high emission vehicle um, from, from, like, as your next car? And someone yesterday, I think it was Chris, that talked about uh, pledges. So I'll be talking a little bit more about pledges. As the voluntary action for green energy is, would you pledge to buy green energy from your energy supplier? Now this was done, this study was done in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where for, uh, I think for around 10 to, five to ten dollars per hundred kilowatt hours, you could actually buy green energy from community energy. So people really did have this option, and this is not a common throughout the nation. The soft regulation question is, would you support a tax break for a high mileage or low emission vehicle? And for the, regu uh, for the green energy cases, would you support an automatic purchase of green energy with an opt-out allowance? So that's changing the default. For the hard regulation cases, would you support government restricting the purchase of SUVs or trucks? And would you support a government uh, regulation requiring a particular energy mix with, with a really high percentage coming from green energy? So these are the types of questions that I asked for voluntary action, soft regulation, and hard regulation for both SUVs and trucks and green energy. Then I also wanted to look at framing. So we, we've, we've talked a lot about how framing affects behavior. So Levin and Gaith in 1988 showed that framing really affects consumer purchases. They had the same exact ground beef, same amount of fat in both. They labeled one as 75% lean and the other as 25% fat. Same exact ground beef. Almost all of their participants wanted to buy this version and not this version, even though it was exactly the same. So what this shows is that framing is really powerful in terms of affecting consumer preferences. 